Ladies and gentlemen, boys and ghouls, to all of our non-binary friends, to everyone on the spectrum and in between, my name is Ken Stactic, and welcome to another episode of The Shutter Show. With me, as always, is... David Marlowe. And, David, how you doing this week? You know, Ken, I'm pretty damn tired. I've been, uh, you know, deciding to... I made this terrible choice where, where I decided to, what, get healthy? And do uh, a boot camp now that... You got healthy or you got in trouble? Why did you go to boot camp? Um, <laughs> no, a fitness uh, boot camp. So you paid uh, money. Yes. To so so I'm, paying, I'm, I'm paying people money to yourself. torture yourself. No, David, you pay money to torture other people. Don't... What are you doing? Ken. David. Ken. David. I've, I, I gotta exercise some demons, Ken. And you know, I... I I feel like you pay somebody else to make the demons exercise. I feel like the demons are making you exercise. Now, I, I get it, Ken. You're not from the Midwest. We do things a little bit differently there. Yes, I know. You call it pop when it's clearly soda. Nobody ever orders a vodka and pop. That's just not what people do. Well, Ken, I'm in a mood and I'm tired because I can't drink alcohol. Well, you can. I'm watching you do so. I've watched you do so. Ken, this is not, this is heresy. This is this is David, not this is not alcohol. This, this is this is an adult pop. This is completely off the rails, and it's not pop. It is a beer, young man. Fake news. Well, anyway, so David, what's the movie we're talking about this week? Ah, well, Ken, funny you should ask because uh, we got a special treat for folks today. Do we? Yes. Um, what's the name of the movie though? The name is Slacks. Ooh. And I did I, I I did not check to see whether or not there was a uh, a tagline for this one, but I feel like uh, why do I feel like it's it's a small price to pay for a nice ass? It'll scare the pants off of you. <laughs> there isn't one, but I feel like if I, I feel like if they're not using that, I'm I'm kind of disappointed. I know, right? It seems like that seems like low hanging fruit, but maybe that's why. There, well, that's why I haven't directed a, a feature yet. Anyway, that's not important. Um, but yeah, no. Um, so we picked this movie, uh, or I think more accurately, like I picked this movie this because movie it, picked us. This movie picked us because um, a lot of our listeners were messaging in, and I had a whole bunch of people recommend this movie, and who just wanted to hear our opinion on it. Please watch the Canadian Killer Pants movie. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a normal um, comment that normal people say all the time. And so I told them that, I, that we might take a look at it. Um, but first, I wanted to see maybe perhaps we could uh, get somebody to from the production to talk to us. Ooh, did we did we get somebody from the production to talk to us? And I, I got a. I, I was able to pull a couple of strings, and I got somebody. I mean, it's Ooh. not it's not much. It's just was the, it was it the caterer, the PA. Was it the not assistant as, to the wardrobe designer? Not as good as the assistant to the wardrobe designer. Boo. But I was able to get the writer and director oh, that's of good. Slacks, Ooh. Elsa Kephart. Oh, shit. Okay, well, then, I guess, David, uh, our only option is going to be uh, to open up the time machine, and we're going to have to travel in time to that time that we talked exactly. to the director of the writer and director of Slacks. <gasps> Beep, 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 beep. David, let's ride. Okay, so uh, Elza, you came up with this idea 20 years ago when you and your friends were joking about how much you hated the word slacks. Right. Why do you hate the word slacks and what other words do you hate? <laughs> well, it's not me who hates the word slacks. It's my friend Andrea. So she okay. was the one who hated the word. And so we kept teasing her about it. I hate the word panties. I think it's so gross. <laughs> And my writing partner, uh, Patricia, hates the word moist. Oh, I've known, I, I have a, yeah, I've had several friends who hated the word moist for reasons that I kind of understand. <laughs> uh, um, so was the idea, uh, did it come fully formed to you? Was like, was the initial idea just killer pants? Or did the, like, the social uh, message, did that come like later on? Yeah, yeah, no, the initial idea was really just killer pants. I think that's why it took so long to get the idea uh, formed because it was really a one note joke. And um, we wrote a really bad script that took place in the high school and it was so bad. We had to create like all these 
extraneous characters to, to give it something more than just killer pants killing teenage girls. Um, and then we sort of crept towards uh, where, it, where the script ended up when Patricia, who had worked at The Gap um, for many years in university, said one day, well, why don't we just set it in a store? It makes so much more sense because it's about pants. And I was like, duh, of course. So we, we like we rewrote it and it was still not great because there still wasn't actually the social commentary. And then this last draft is when um, I, we started rewriting it and it still was sort of, you know, cute, but not um, not quite there. And then I saw a documentary on fast fashion called The True Cost as I was doing research. And that really galvanized me. And that's when the idea really totally gelled. And I was like, oh my God, it's about a child laborer who is killed and becomes a pair of killing pants. Like, so I, I have to say um, it didn't come to us straight away, but I think, I really think the idea was there just waiting for us to like, to mature. Um, I know Slacks is like patiently waiting to be born. She was just like, <laughs> all right, after all. And so, so this film, it's a statement on the harms and abuses that have come as a result of um, what you, uh, what's called when you, uh, yeah, when yeah, you yeah, fast fashion. Yeah, I remember fast you saying um, the term fast, fact, uh, fast fashion. And so for folks like myself who might not be as conscious about fashion and how it operates, uh, could you possibly explain the concept of fast fashion and maybe talk about its effects on the world? Sure. So fast fashion was really born from uh, Zara, the creator of Zara, um, who who has a company called Indie Text, and he he sort of and this is just research I did um, based on research I did. So he decided that why should fashion just have four? Um, what's the word? Oh my God, I'm blanking on it. Uh, four collections, you know, summer, winter, fall, and spring why shouldn't we just have new collections every three weeks? Um, and so he created this really disposable kind of fashion that was done really cheaply, but would churn them out in relatively small numbers. And so if you missed it, you know, you're like, oh shit, I missed that sparkly top. And so people um, really became, or are still addicted to going to Zara, which is one of the big ones. Um, of course, there's H&M is another huge fast fashion uh, store. And then all the other stores have followed suit because they're being left in the in the cold. Um, Uniqlo tends, you know, says that it's not, and I guess it's not as bad, but I still think it's pretty bad. Because um, mm -hmm. Uniqlo is, is, I was really influenced by the design for the store. So I mentioned it. And so it's this kind of like, it's like fast food, you know, it's, it's, um, made really cheaply with cheap labor um, and it's not good for you. And it's the more you buy, the more you dispose. And so people, it's like Kleenex, people will buy a t-shirt for five bucks because it's cheap and then they run out, it runs out of style. And so the, people literally will throw out clothes even rather than send it to Goodwill, but even oh. Goodwill can't handle this, um, this load. So as, as much as we think we're doing good by giving our clothes away, the secondhand stores are just overloaded. And so they take all this fashion, and they ship it to Africa um, because that's where the garbage of the world ends up in, unfortunately, like literally garbage. Uh, and then this kills the local fashion industry because there's all these, you know, almost free Western clothes. And then when they can't, there's like literally mountains and mountains of, of, of clothes um, that the, even Africa can't handle. And so they burn it or they try to bury it. And so it becomes this horrible trash. So um, yeah, that's fast fashion. <laughs> and the way it's done is really, you know, it's, they use child labor. Like there's the whole, I don't know if you're just recently the controversy over the Uyghurs um, in China being used as basically slave labor to pick cotton. Um, and, and, you know, happens in India and Bangladesh, there's child labor. And then the conditions that they make the clothes in are really terrible. So the employees are, you know, aren't protected. They use dyes, you know, with, I've seen videos where they, they literally are dyeing something without a mask and it's super toxic. They're like putting their hands in these dye vats and then they just dump the dye in their local streams. It's, it's like nothing is good about fast fashion. 
Now, are these the buildings that have like the suicide nets that we've heard about um, in the news? Or is, is um, that part of this? I think that's Apple. Yeah, that's China. Apple. Oh, is that? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, God. that's your iPhone, buddy. Yeah, uh, yeah. But um, but like the the Joe Fresh, which is a Canadian brand, had a had a, a subcontractor whose building collapsed in Bangladesh because they weren't up to code and they couldn't be bothered to repair it because who cares about Bengalis? You know, they're just trash. Um, obviously, I don't mean that. But um, and and so they killed I don't know a thousand people because the building <laughs> collapsed. Because they're like, I don't care if they're disposable, just like the clothes we make. It's really oh my god. It's pretty. It's like I'm being flippant about it, but it's. It's quite horrifying and it's not just clothes it's it's electronics as well and um you know any plastic shit that we end up buying and like, i would oh, argue that cute. sometimes you feel like you can only just be flippant because it's just like <laughs> after a while you've said it so many times that you're just like oh, yeah we've been saying this for such and such amount of time well, you know yeah, well it's kind of like the like everybody who wants to raise money for breast cancer awareness and it's like no the awareness isn't where the money needs to go it needs to go to like research we all we all know about it, and and yeah. as a result, yeah, and it's got to feel the same way. Where you're like, no, everybody knows about this. It just turns out that we don't actually care that much, and that's a yeah. bummer to Problem. realize. And so, and in your film, like a film that I would say paints a pretty bleak picture of the industry. Like, what solutions would you recommend to folks who are seeing this well, film who maybe are wondering, like, buy, well, don't buy clothes. Don't buy clothes. <laughs> no, it's true. I'm I'm not. I'm like. Only there's so many clothes out there. There's so much, there's so much clothing. Mm -hmm. Like secondhand stores are just buy secondhand clothes. Like okay. I, I have, I, fa I have family in the U S and when I go visit, you know, in my family in Grand Junction, Colorado, I'm like, Goodwill. We go to the Goodwill and I like stock up on clothes. Cause there's so much great clothes there. It's like better than in Montreal. <laughs> Projection. <laughs> um, I would say limit your purchases. You know, like people treat consumerism like uh, an addiction. So people buy clothes that they don't need to get a little hit. And I, I've done that. I've, I'm totally guilty of it where I've gone in like, uh, we have this store called Winners in Canada. It's like a TJ Maxx. And I'll be like, oh, I'm feeling blue. I'm going to go to Winners and like buy myself something I don't need. And so I've done it. So it's to resist that temptation of, of consumption as like a, as a panacea for what, what ails you. Um, and really think whether you need an upgrade on your iPhone because they're designed to be obsolete. You know, it's not a, they're designed to be obsolete in two generations or whatever. And so to realize that we're being manipulated, just like people in the, you know, in South Asia or Africa are being literally like coerced to, to work, we're being coerced to buy. Um, and so it's really becoming aware of that and and putting a stop to it in our, you know, we have the power not to buy things. We yeah. cannot yeah. buy things and we can repair them and we can, you know, swap or recycle or all that stuff. I think um, I would say that's, and it's hard. I get it, <laughs> we, we can do it. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So very serious question. How do you go about directing a pair of killer pants? <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Um, we created them. So it was all done live because I really wanted like the old school feel. Oh, so all uh, practical. All practical. Yeah. 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 Except for when the, the like SS logo fills up with blood that was done. In okay. Yeah, okay. That's, that's understandable. Um, uh, and so we bought, pairs of jeans from a Montreal store that does actually make jeans in an ethical way. We went to their warehouse and we saw their seamstress. <laughs> seamstress he's like, like, yeah, he's like, like, you guys aren't just using subcontractors, right? No, no, no. We <laughs> saw them at work. Um, and um, so we bought a whole bunch of pairs of them. And then the special effects team just tried out a whole bunch of different rigs to see, you know, how to make them work. So they would try something out and send it to me, send a video of like the pants crawling and I would give them notes and I really directed them to make it seem like an insect almost at times, you know, like that sort of weird crawl. and A little inchworm. Exactly. Uh, and then we um, worked with a puppeteer for when the, the pants were actually upright. So she, she sort of in, imbued, when there's that little clip at the end when you see her dance, that's the puppeteer. Which was so just delightful, I, by the way. Yeah. 
she was great. I mean, she's a professional puppeteer. And so we had discussions of how she would act and, you know, she would do a take and I'd be like, more like this. So I had to direct <laughs> the pants, um, but she was great. It was, it was hard though. It was, you know, like you have these pants and they have to look and feel like real, like they're animated with a spirit. And so sometimes I was just like, I don't know. I think this works. <laughs> did she already just, know the Bollywood dance or did she have to learn that? No, she learned it. We got a Bollywood um, choreographer to, to oh, come fun. in and come up with a little dance. Yeah. 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 A woman who's been doing it since she was like five, five years old. So she really she choreographed it. They practiced it. There's a cute little video of them where you can see them practicing. <laughs> it's really cute. Oh, I love it. So like, with such a strange concept, like how did you go about pitching this to both the producers and the on-screen talent? Because I, you don't just open with killer pants, I imagine, or did you? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's okay. what I said. They're like, so what are you working on? I'm like, oh, it's a movie by killer pants. And then people are like, huh? That's okay. actually the best opening line because people can't ignore it. And then I tell them the whole story about how it's about child labor, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, okay, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> um, but we pitched it, Patricia and I pitched it at the Fantasia F uh, Film Festival um, co-production market called Frontiers. So we had like a five minute pitch in front of an audience of producers. And I guess they really liked our pitch. So our, our producing partner, Anne-Marie Jelina, came on board. She was like, oh my God, I love it. I have to make this. I mean, she she produced Turbo Kid and I had seen her react to the pitch of Turbo Kid the same way. And I was like, yes, if we get her on board, she'll get this made. And and you know, the funding bodies just, they bought it because of the, of the message. And they knew, you know, I've been around for a while. I've been making horror films sort of on my own. So they're like, oh, I was like, yeah, part, she's back, but she has a real story this time. So it was actually pretty, pretty easy. I think because it was about, there was a real deep social message and I, I wrote a real, you know, thorough director's treatment. And, um, and then the talent, I mean, we went through a casting director and they sent the script and they're, they're all a bit like at first, like, is this serious? How should I act? And then when we saw them, we explained it to them in the, at the, um, after the soft tapes, you know, and they're like, okay, oh, they met us. And they're like, okay, you're okay. You're a bunch of ladies. You're sort of kooky. Oh, okay. So meeting <laughs> us was really the, what's, what, what sealed the deal where they knew that we were, this was serious and they could trust us you know um it's really important to get the cast to trust you but when they saw the sets you know the sets um they were like okay we're in a real it's a real film so that really helped well yeah and i feel like because this is a, a type of film that if say it had like a male director on the helm there's the risk that it could kind of turn a little exploitative mm -hmm. but one of the things that i liked about this film is it wasn't so much about on the actor's bodies as they were putting the pants on, mm. like the camera always pans away from that kind of shot. Yeah, and yeah. I do, like with a lot of, you know, campier films about random killer objects, I think you find that it tries to fill that void with exploitation or sexploitation. And yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really glad that, you, that this was a film that didn't go that direction. Yeah, I mean, I had no interest in uh, exploiting women's bodies. I mean, I did have really like key moments on Gemma's butt because to me that was like, see, you're looking at her ass. How does it feel? Ha 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 ha. <laughs> you know, it was like the female gaze sort of calling on the male on the male gaze, um, but it was always very done very much on on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, this isn't a movie about sex. It's, it's a movie about exploiting people. <laughs> yeah, I guess. At me, absolutely, 100%. Um, Ken, do uh, you have a question? Yeah, uh, how did you collaborate with your cinematographer and what did uh, Steve Aislinn uh, bring to the table? Oh, Steve is awesome. He's totally insane. Like, he's great. He, he's, he's a super famous DP in Quebec. He's been shooting things since forever. So I'd never met him, but people told me he was really nice. And um, and I when I saw, like I had seen films he'd shot, but I saw a bunch more just to make sure um, when we off when we when we called him to see if he was interested. I was like, oh man, if he if he comes on board, this is gonna look so awesome. 
so I actually met him and he was like coming out from a shoot. He's a total workaholic. And he was like, sorry, I haven't read the script, but a killer pants. I love it. I'm, I'm in. And I was like, <laughs> maybe you should read the script. He's like, no killer pants. It's like rubber. Right. I was like, well, not really. It's more serious. It has a point. He was like, killer pants. Like you had me at killer pants. I was like, okay. Were you worried that this would kind of get tied in with films like rubber or. Yeah, a little bit, but I knew that once people saw it, they wouldn't, you know, they're like, Oh, it's a killer object movie, but it really stands out on its own. But, but to go back to Steve, he, he brought in his whole crew. They were super awesome. They like totally came on board. They, they brought all their gear. Um, and they were so, so, so fast. They were one of the reasons we were able to shoot it, you know, in 23 days with all these effects. And they were just super professional. Like I, I, I'd never shot a union shoot. I'd always shot low budget. And I was like, oh my God, there's all these guys, these camera guys, these gaffers. Are they going to like second guess me and blah, blah. No, they were super awesome. They are like, would you like a, a viewfinder for the lens? And I was like, yes, I guess I would. <laughs> Like nobody's so ever asked me that. No, no, they were really, <laughs> he's really sweet and like totally wacky. So, so it was great. I loved working with him. Now, in, given that you've worn so many different hats in filmmaking, like what aspect or part of film fascinates you the most? Like what do you enjoy the most out of it? Hmm. To be fair, she wears a lot of pants. True. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Oh, you. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of different aspects I like. I guess that's why I like filmmaking because you don't have to do just one thing. You don't have to like just paint. Um, I mean, I, I really love writing. I love coming up with an idea. I love writing the characters, like coming up with the characters' voices. Like I loved writing Craig so much. It was such a trip. It was so fun. Uh, I love doing visual research like um, for art direction. I, I really... Uh, I really get excited about that. And then, you know, getting on the set and having to figure out what the film itself wants, like it's, it's one thing. So you have all these things, all these things lined up. And then the film itself is like, this is what I'm going to be. And you're like, oh, okay. Like for Slacks, I thought it was going to be at first much funnier and just totally campy, but the actors are so good and brought such gravitas and the cinematography was quite creepy and beautiful. I was like, wait, this is sort of different than, and the producers too, they're like, this isn't a horror comedy. What are you doing? And I was like, well, this <laughs> is what I've set it up. So, and so then, then you have to find your way through what the film itself wants to be. And that's really harrowing. That's really hard and, and like, it's really freaky. Um, but that's really interesting because you it's almost like a total leap of faith, like almost like a religious experience where you're like, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm trusting that this is going to work and I have to find the thing. Um, so, yeah, I like all these different aspects of it. Now, I, this is your third feature. Um, what have you learned about making characters likable? that you've kind of learned along the way, like that you didn't know when you were first starting out that you've now figured out now that you've got a lot more experience. Likeable? Just get good actors. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> like good actors will make an unlikable character compelling. I don't think characters have to be likable necessarily. I think they have to be compelling. Um, yeah, because like I, I love Craig. He's my favorite character of Slacks, <laughs> aside from Slacks. Um, but I was really worried. We cast him last, actually. And I was really worried we wouldn't find someone to pull that, that um, character off because he's so complex. Um, and so I realized it, it, it took a really good actor. I think I, what I've learned is that don't, don't care about what the character looks like in your mind. Um, but really when an actor comes in with the right energy of the character, that's when, you know, you have to put aside what they looked like before and just realize that this is the right person. Um, is there, 
Uh, is there something that you wanted to talk about that you haven't been asked in an interview yet? Like just a, a question or a thing that you're like, oh, actually I wanted to bring this up or a person who helped, you know, bring something to the film that you nobody's asked you about? Mm, not really. I mean, I wanted to talk about climate change. I don't know if this is where. Oh, no, no. Uh, just, uh, I mean, sure, go ahead. No, and, and that's in, this later. in a couple of interviews uh, of yours. Like, I understand, like, you have done, like, a great deal of work on behalf of climate activism. Like, I'm please, like, yeah. could you tell us more about um, that and what your work entails? Yeah. Um, I mean, I never really was an activist. I always sort of went to protests and stuff, and I would go to demonstrations in front of the American consulate. In, Canada, in Montreal whenever they decided to bomb something that I thought was inappropriate. <laughs> and, but it, it, in 2018, I realized that when the Secretary General said that, uh, of the UN said that we had 10 years to sort of turn the ship around, I was like, holy shit. That's when the shoe dropped and I realized I couldn't just, just do filmmaking. Oh no, sorry, there was a fly that got on the camera. And so it's like- I know, right? yeah. I was like, what is this <laughs> shadow? <laughs> Someone, you know, there was a fly at one point and someone's like, is that a cat? I was like, no, it's a fly. I know. The fly's like, save the planet. I know. No, I'm, not. I'm trying to kill them. <laughs> I've like set up various traps and they don't seem to, to really want to go for it. Oh, I mean, when it's that hot there, the, I'm sure the flies are just unbearable. <laughs> but yes, please, please do go on. <laughs> Anyways, that's, I don't know. I realized then that I was like, oh shit, we're in big trouble. Um, and so I joined Extinction Rebellion Quebec and I really, it was like a crash course in activism. Um, and I learned a lot about, you know, social change and the theory of social change that I had no clue. And that I, I felt like I couldn't just stand by and be just a filmmaker, even though I think Slacks is doing a great deal to get to, to raise awareness of consumerism mm -hmm. and fast fashion and stuff. And so, yeah, I, I decided to form afterwards a little group called the Ministry of the New Normal, where it's a bunch of ladies and we act like we're ministers if, if, as if our government took the climate crisis seriously. So we do actions as a ministry <laughs> to, to like, you know, just stir shit up. Um, mm -hmm. But I realized how much um, activism has done so much to change our society. Um, where we think maybe, oh, it's this just happens to be like women just happen to get the vote. You know, it, it was just <laughs> that time. No, it was, you know, hardcore militant activism. Um, so a lot of social change that I used to just take for granted, I realized that as something that just happened. Oh, it was just time that it came from decades of people pushing. I mean, like the civil rights movement, I know just didn't just happen. <laughs> I'm not that naive, but but um but yeah, so I thought, well, I want to be part of that for climate, uh, the climate crisis. I don't want to just leave it up to other people. I want to be a cog, even though it's a small cog in the, in the activist world and hope that my small crazy actions, you know, will, will somehow bear fruit. Um, yeah, and that's, I think... What I'd like to say is that uh, we all think it's not climate change is not our problem, but it's really everyone's problem. Oh, abs it absolutely is. And I mean, you <laughs> take one you take one small cog out of a machine, and the whole machine stops. So there's, I, in my opinion, there's no cog too small. I suppose is sure a better a better analogy for it. <laughs> well, um, we can workshop that one. So. Yeah, we'll workshop it. We'll, we'll see we're Thought I was getting all deep with that, yeah, but uh, not too bad. <laughs> But so, um, and I guess like with the message that you're trying to put forward with this film, um, I think one of the things that I was surprised by was like the 77 minute runtime. Was there mm -hmm. any material from the cutting room floor that you wish you could have kept? Yeah, is there like a kept heart cut that we should be looking for on uh, HBO Go? No, no, no. Um, I write really short scripts. I don't, mm -hmm. my scripts are naturally short. Like I think they're, they run, they don't run more than 85 pages. So Slack's, the script itself was like 77 pages. Oh, wow. And we ended up, yeah, we ended up cutting a scene that we had to reshoot to put back in because we realized it did, the film didn't work without it. We cut like bits of scenes that maybe were too long, like dialogue that was running on. 
this one cheesy scene where, where Libby and Slacks had like a heart to heart, which was terrible. It was like a, the Muppet show. And the first day <laughs> on the day we shot it, it was like, this will never make it in the film. I was like, I need to shoot it anyways. Fuck you. And then, yeah, he was right. <laughs> he got it out of the film. So, and we actually had to create a few more scenes because we were missing like beats of Slacks. Um, so I tend to be almost too much, too economical. And then I actually rather shoot less and then cut the film and realize, should we really need this and shoot too much and then realize we still need stuff that we didn't have because we shot stuff we didn't need anyways. Yeah, use, use every part of the buffalo, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, and like some directors end up shooting like at a 50 or 100 to 1 ratio. And it's, I mean, it's great if you can get away with it, but it's also like, you know, maybe this is why movies cost so much and maybe you should hire someone who can, you know, Direct. shoot three movies for the same amount. Maybe that movie doesn't need to be four hours long. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I went to film school and I shot, I, I learned on film. And so you had to be economical because film cost a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I don't adhere to the 50 take like Stanley Kubrick. Like that's for mentally deranged people, you know, like no one's <laughs> going to notice that it's take 13 versus take 45 like that's just in your mind I don't care what people say like David Fincher does 50 takes like like sure you can get for technical reasons but after a while it's like sort of no one has seen this so no one had seen the the 50 takes so I'm sure if you take number two or number 10 it's the same but that's I don't like excess really so that's maybe more my personality just the amount of time it takes to process that amount of Footage. Well, I mean, it fits with the theme of the movie that, you know, I mean, it would be pretty hypocritical to be like, ah, I do 50 takes and it's all this about this movie about not wasting material for, for, for clothing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I guess. Um, yeah, sort of wrapping it up here. Yeah, sort of wrapping it up. Like, like so you're, you're one of the co-founders of the Montreal chapter of uh, Film Fatales. Mm-hmm. So how has being part of an ever growing community of female filmmakers shaped your work up to now and and what do you look forward to in the future oh it was uh great i got involved with film fatale almost um like i'm i'm just the co-founder now i'm not actively um involved in running Mm -hmm. the the organization um well it started with a group in montreal called uh it's called realisatrice equitable so in french that means in english that means uh sustainable directors Um, And so they really turned me on to the idea that things weren't equal for women. And maybe there was a reason I wasn't able to get my films financed. And it wasn't just that I was, you know, crap. (laughs) It was that I was a woman, maybe. So that was the first um, insight into sort of the inequitable conditions. And that was only, you know, uh, seven years ago, eight years ago. So it's not that long ago. And then... That really sort of sparked me to the fact that there was a problem. And when I heard about Film Fatale and that it was a, an international organization, I thought, well, it would be cool to be part of that and to sort of connect all the women directors in Montreal to, to a wider network. And so with two other women directors, we founded it. And, and it was great because it gave us all a space to sort of talk and share and uh, and connect and I'm still I uh, it has we haven't really had a meeting obviously since COVID duh. um but it's I'm still part of the, the larger chapter like those great initiatives and stuff so I see I mean I I see so the, a huge change I think in the past five years things have really sort of drastically uh changed just yesterday I was on a call with an agent um, it was organized by our Canadian Directors Union and there was every agent, they encourage agents who'd never met certain directors to meet like 10 directors they'd never met. And on this one call where we had the agent and then all the different directors, I think there was one guy, <laughs> the rest were women. So this was people he'd chosen to meet um, and women of all different uh, varied backgrounds. And so just seeing that, I was like, holy shit, like this is day and night since from what I remember it being where I was the only woman in the room. Um, so I think it's great. I think it's I think there's a, a tipping point has been reached and it's just a matter of time before men and women are directing equally at, at equal budget levels. I mean, that's, that's still 
something to, to work towards, but I think it's so, uh, now people are so aware of it that there's no going back. We can't pretend that, you know, oh, she just doesn't, you know, she's just not bossy enough. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's not going to work anymore. <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm very um, heartened. We just have to keep pushing and, and keep, keep making films and keep saying like, no, I want to make a hundred million dollar movie. Well, I don't really, that's too much, too much <laughs> millions. But like, hey, I wouldn't mind ten million. <laughs> yeah, it's, which is sort of on the low end these days. Ten yeah. million. But yeah, we well, used oh, to be for, really. For, there's I just mean, no middle end these days, and that's yeah. that's kind of <laughs> the problem. True. Like, yeah, I, I I think studios would be a lot better off making like thirty three million dollar films than making one hundred million dollar film. Like, it's just like, well, yeah, we well, have one roll of the dice, and it might hit big, but you're yeah. more likely to get something with one of those smaller ones, and like. Some of them will come out in the wash, but you also end up with a lot of really interesting stuff. I mean, and then like uh, you were saying before, like, you know, uh, women wanting to get uh, the bigger budgets. I think uh, Chloe, um, Chloe Zhao is going to be a great example of someone taking a nomad land and then going on to do like the Eternals, um, which I yeah. all the pre-early buzz has been just out of this world positive on. So that's yeah. No, I, I agree. That's, uh, we, we've we seem to have hit some sort of tipping point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see here. Um, what do you have uh, coming up next? Oh, well, I uh, wrote a French language um, supernatural thriller with a a longtime friend and collaborator. It's about a middle aged woman who has a fatal disease and who moves into a luxurious house with her new lover, her young lover, only to realize that it's possessed by a violent ghost who wants only to become reincarnated. And so she realizes that the ghost, through the mechanism of his Incarnate reincarnation holds the key to her survival. Ooh, okay, it's, sounds it's fun. It's called uh, Cher Obscure, and then um, my writing partner on Slack's and I developing a vampire TV show. Oh wow! Which I've been okay. Told everyone's everyone's like, oh, if it doesn't have a uh, original IP, never mind. And we're like, we've been developing this for like ten years. Oh my god! <laughs> it was original. It was no, I mean, um, not original. It is, I'm sure. Like they want, they want things that have been our books to turn into TV shows. So they're like, mm-hmm. oh, this is just comes from your imagination. It's no good. Yeah. yeah, go write it as a book or a comic book first, and then we'll talk to you. And you're like, can I just skip the middle part? No, okay. <laughs> Literally, yeah, I know. And then Patricia, so we're, then we're writing a, a fiction, a feature, which we um, we call. Well, the title is not Killer Trees, but we call it Killer Trees, but it's about an a ecosystem and a real ecosystem this time who, who takes uh, revenge on being threatened with sur- its survival being threatened. So and it's uh, set in the Middle Ages. Okay. Great. Well, uh, Elsa, as I see here, um, as we're just kind of wrapping up here. Um, do, you, uh, do you have any plugs that you want to uh, plug? Do you have any social media you want the people to know where, where you're at? Any charities, anything like that? Um, charities? Yeah, I would say I, I donate regularly to uh, Indigenous Climate Action Network. So they do great work um, with getting Indigenous uh, folks money to, you know, battle like the government of Canada that tries to impose pipelines on unceded territory. <laughs> so if anyone wants to donate to them, I highly recommend it. And plugs, no, I'm not really, I'm on Facebook, but um, I'm not on the other social media because um, it's my brain can't handle. So I, I envy you dearly. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I think agents look at if you're on Instagram and if you're not, or if you have two followers, they like flush you. So yeah, well, an- another problem I, I feel like we need to to solve at some point where social media shouldn't be the, the, the guiding factor in what gets made. No, but that's, you know, sadly, that's just who I am. So yeah. <laughs> I just have to watch my films. Well, Ken, you don't have Facebook either. So yeah, no. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's, yeah. Off, he's off the Facebook grid. That's why that's wow, why that's I run amazing. our Instagram page. Yeah, I'm just on Twitter. <laughs> okay. I think one uh, is enough. Well, Elza. Thank you so much for your time. We we really yeah. appreciate you um, uh, using up your time in Morocco to to talk with us two schmucks here. Um, so seriously, we we wish you all the safety in the world um, and and a heck of a good week. And we hope it gets maybe a little cooler there. Yeah, looking forward to the next uh, movie. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Bye bye. Take care. Do, do.
Whoa, David. Uh, well, that was uh, fun. What a what a wonderful woman. Yeah, she was she was absolutely delightful. Yeah, and all the way in Morocco. All wild the way. stuff. Which, I, like, what was she said? Was like over like a hundred degrees there? Yeah, crazy stuff. Um, there's a part that there's a part in the interview that unfortunately people aren't going to get to see because at one point, like, because because it's so hot in Morocco, there's just flies all over where she is right now. And one happened to uh, crawl over the camera. The webcam, yeah. It was yeah, the webcam. Over. And, and so, yeah, so... Very alarming for David and I. Yeah. <laughs> to which she noticed that we were startled by something and she thought it was behind her. She's like, what? Yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> no, no. It, it's just it's just the large fly on here. But, but no, no. Like that... For one thing, um, a huge, huge thank you to Elsa for taking the time to Sit talk to us, us two schmucks. Um, really, really grateful for for all the input that she she laid upon us for for this film. Um, but yeah, now it's time to step away from that interview, and maybe let's let's get our let's get our viewpoint on this one. Yeah, wrap our brains around this one. Yeah, David, what'd you think of this movie? I enjoyed it. I I, I enjoyed it far more than I expected to because. I don't know. Something about when you're told it's a movie about killer pants, your expectations aren't exactly high. The the bar for killer things movies is not super high. No, like rubber, the, I would say, is the highest. Uh, well, like it depends. Well, it depends on if you're gonna bifurcate and you include killer cars as part of killer things. Yeah, because like I would argue that probably Christine is maybe the king. Of the uh, no pun intended of the killer uh, killer thing genre, uh, where yes, I, w- I would agree that Rubber is definitely up there, or definitely up there for the most um, avant garde. Maximum Overdrive isn't your uh, no. Maximum Overdrive is not good. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Stephen. Uh, in that case, you were not the king. What like a killer Coke machine? Doesn't no. do it for you. Uh, no, uh, the uh, deathbed, the bed that eats people, while fun, also doesn't really. Do it for Does it me. scratch that itch? No, not not entirely. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm trying to think. What are the other good big dead or the big dead? Uh, the big uh, killer uh, thing movies. Uh, well, I mean, there's your movie. Well, yes, Toy Box. There's, yes, yeah, there's the Toy Box. The, yes, kill, the, the, the killer RV. Yes, no, no, no. There's definitely that. Yeah, check that out on Amazon Prime, everybody. Uh, yes, no, no. I, yeah, it's, I don't believe it's on Hulu anymore. But yes, no. Uh, with Denise Richards and Misha Barton, it's a it's a good old time if you like. Movies about RVs. Yeah, you were the cin- you were the cinematographer it's for that true. one. That is exactly what I was on that. Yeah, and it, it's a good looking movie. Thank you very much. What are you looking up? Uh, oh, you're looking up. Ken's Ken's looking over to see. He's like, oh, okay, looking up yeah, killer yeah. thing movies. Uh, this is too hard to Google, Google while we're doing a show. Anyway, all right, doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, let's see here. So uh, so uh, let's see here. What did I feel about this movie? I thought this movie had a lot of strengths. Uh, I think uh, there are some things that will people that people will will, will complain about for sure. Um, but I think overall this movie is a ton of fun, and particularly for a movie that very much could have phoned it in when it came to what it was trying to do and just be a killer pants movie. This movie went uh, went farther and tried to say a little something, tried to do something a little interesting, and tried to bring uh, a certain uh, a certain. Uh, let's see here. What's, uh, what's a good way? Like a message. Uh, bring a certain message to bring a certain maturity. Okay, yeah, I'd say that's a good word for it. Yeah, to, and, and not just making it goopy, like goofy. Like it's definitely campy. Do not get yeah. me wrong. The, it's, but, it's far campier in the first half than it is in the second half. Yes, no, the, the second half definitely firms up and becomes much more on message. And you could argue that it loses a little bit of its tee-hee-hee in that standpoint. But in the same point, uh, I would say that that's what starts to separate it from a lot of the other movies in this genre, which tend to just be, wouldn't it be funny if X was killing people? Yeah. Um, and there was, so yeah, like I would say halfway through, it, it does end up on more of a serious note. And I think some of the complaints that some people would have about this film, I would say are some of the things that other people would like about this film. The fact that it's uh, it's got a runtime of 77 minutes 
and it's nice, tight, and concise. Oh, it's very breezy. Um, and that's and that's how she wrote it. I think she wrote it. I, she said it was about seventy-seven pages long. And I think what was like the term that I threw yeah, out like was seventy-seven eighty-five somewhere in there. Is my guess is what the final you know, script page with with, with also yeah. she, she had mentioned that there was a couple of little bits that they added in at the end because they were running a little bit of short on time. So I'm sure once you make those adjustments, it's somewhere in that range. Yeah, and, and so it, it's 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 straight to the point. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't necessarily hit you over the head too hard with certain thing with, with, with the message itself, and it's just this is what this is what this film is. This is what we're really trying to put across. Um, really makes a statement towards um, fast fashion and Absolutely. and the dangers and the the unfortunate effects that it has on our planet and on our society as a whole. Which I going into this before she sort of laid it out, I, I really didn't quite understand the concept of fast fashion because most of my clothes that I, I don't buy clothes very often. Um and when I do, I I don't I don't break the bank for them. David actually gets all of his clothes from an old Scottish woman who has her old loom uh that she powers with her foot and then there's a gaggle of sheep. So David is very soft, yeah. but also very warm and very sweaty. It's the only way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And like All you people going to H&M, I don't get it. Like just, just call Charlotte, for the love of God. Do yourself a favor. She's a lovely woman. She is. Uh, a little I, hairy, but... I, yeah, yes, well, but, so I wanted to say there's two movies that I was actually forgetting in the, in the killer thing list. And one I think is very important, and one is uh, Amityville Horror. And kind of yes. all... All haunted house movies become their own kind of mini genre of haunted or like killer thing list. Um, the other movie that I wanted to mention Monster is actually house. Uh, Monster House is another great example. I mean, like literally any of them, uh, the haunting, haunting of Hill House, any of them where the house the house is literally haunted, like the house actually does stuff, would count under this. Um, and then yeah, and then you have your next big genre bifurcation of that would be killer cars which is just kind of like, you know, because people live in their cars, so it's just kind of like a smaller house, which is what Toy Box is. It's just an RV, which is just a house on wheels, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, the way that we would describe Toy Box was just, it's a haunted house except the house can move. Yeah. And then uh, and then the, the other smaller group that this is part of is in the killer other oh, stuff. And yeah, and this one ends up being killer jeans. Um, let's see here. David, what did you, what, what did you like best about this movie? I... I like the characters in this, because I, I actually, I, I think, while a lot of them aren't featured around enough to be super, super significant, they were all in some way memorable for me. They all had a very specific look, and the ones that were killed on camera had great death scenes. And I thought they, you can tell everyone was committing to it, you can tell that they... Nobody was phoning in a performance. Nobody was phoning in um, a death scene. The effects used for the jeans, I thought, were great. Like, like you don't expect just, like, yeah, killer jeans that come to life. You don't really expect too much special from there. And our big question was, you know, how, how, do, how does one do killer jeans in CG? And she goes, oh, no CG. At all, at all, with the exception of the little logo that fills with blood in it, it's all in the eye that spins uh, yeah. when when they get um, hypnotized. hypnotized, and then the, like sorry, so I will I want to put an asterisk on her saying it was all practical because the way that they're doing the puppets is a very classical modern technique of creating a puppet and then having somebody behind them in an, a full chroma key green suit yes doing the puppeting and then that person is painted out in post so that painting out is a digital effect true that, that, is, that is CGI. True. well that, i mean that is a is somebody who's worked in visual effects has a lot of friends who worked in visual effects and it's one of those when you want to when because because like when they did the dark crystal uh remake or mm -hmm. not remake the sequel for netflix really they, really breaks my heart that they're not coming back for a second season of that that is a bummer but they talked a lot a lot about how there's going to be no cgi effects in that show and there absolutely are there's tons of set extensions so and uh, uh wire uh, replacements and 
puppeteer removal and there's tons of stuff and that doesn't take anything away from what they're doing and i i much prefer that style of production than the pure cgi it's a healthy merge of the two absolutely and that and that's what i think this needs to be emphasized is yes it does use cgi effects but always to augment the like the primary effect is happening in front of the camera itself. Yeah. And the then it's genes themselves. Yeah, the genes themselves are real. Are onset. real. They are there. They're dancing. They're being puppeteered. Mm-hmm. But then the person who's just puppeteering them, as opposed to having to create some sort of marionette situation, is just able to work behind them. Or I'm assuming also just like they do a, like a mirrored, uh, yeah, a kind of a setup where the you know the legs just match up to the knees and she dances the way it dances. I think. Out of this, one of my favorite deaths had to be the first death. Oh, that's by far the best one. Of, of the woman in the bathroom? Yes, no, uh, yes, uh, Gemma. Yes. Um, and the, <laughs> the pants go to hilariously hide her body. Um, oh, I mean, I thought that reveal was really, really strong. Because like, this movie kind of interestingly kind of goes back and forth between being really bloody and not that gory. And doing stuff like having... The second, the, the second death, the character falls directly into a coat rack and it clearly goes in her face. And you see the blood run down the wall. And you're like, oh, okay, they're not really going to show the gore. And then the next reveal is Gemma bisected underneath the sink with like her entrails out everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then like the death after that is, um, uh, what's his name? The the, the Asian gentleman, uh, Kenny Wong. Oh, yeah. We're, yeah. We're just the, he he's... uses the zipper just to... Vroom. Yeah, to cut off his thumb, and then like you see him cut up in a box, and which I, I, if this were not directed by Elsa, I could, and, and directed by just some random dude who was doing it, I feel like this there would have been a perfect cringe opportunity for dude puts on jeans and goes to the restroom. Very funny. Yeah, very funny. I feel like a, a real missed opportunity there. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's uh. <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's, there's missed opportunity. I think is <laughs> jokingly missed opportunity. Like, because here's the thing. Here's another thing that I really liked about it. It was not about people's bodies. Yes, no, especially it wasn't not. about women's bodies. Yes, it was maybe about like the body culture that comes with wanting to fit into a nice pair of slacks. Good pun. Thanks, um, but. But no, but but like when someone is changing, well, like in, in the changing room, when the girls put the the jeans on the first time, like she takes off her pants in the bathroom, yeah, and like a lot of directors would have been like, and now this is a chance to see her butt, and instead you just see her like kneel yeah. down. The male gaze kind of takes over and sort of eliminates the value. Yeah, of the character. and then she leans up and she puts her pants on, and now she's got the pants on, and like don't get me wrong, this is still a movie who who like the poster is a lady's butt. So it's not a movie that shies away from that, but it's not a movie that lingers on it unnecessarily. There's no, there's no nudity in this movie. There's no, um, yeah, there's no leering. Yeah. There's no like, ooh, like, and that poster is much more of a marketing thing too. Oh well, a- absolutely, and it's not. I mean, it's no worse than anything that you'd see on a Gap ad or an H and M ad, or I mean, frankly, and that's kind of the point. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think one of the big strengths of this movie actually was in the production design, both in the faux commercials, the branding, the um, the terrible music that plays inside. All of that stuff was on point. I loved, loved the use of color in the different sections or the ecosystems, as they're called there. The way that they complemented the outfits that the characters were wearing. I thought all of that worked brilliantly. I thought what one of the, uh, the two big... Perfor- well, a couple of the performances that I, I thought stood out the best. Uh, I thought Brett Donahue as Craig was absolutely amazing. He brought incredible, like, Patrick Bateman energy to this store manager character and really made you see him as uh, a guy who was... Like, I, I've worked for guys like this before who are just so obsessed with making sure that corporate loves them that they're willing to sandal, sell everyone else down the river. The uh, I loved the... Um, corporate leader vibe that uh, Stephen Bogart uh, brought as uh, Harold Lansgrove. I loved like the little tattoo that he had on his and what arm. And what has he been in? I've seen, I, he looks so familiar and I know I've seen him somewhere. Harold, uh, Stephen Bogart, down right there. Yeah, no, um, let's see um, here. He's been in a ton of TV 
he was actually in uh, uh, American Psycho. He was in It. Oh, he was the father. He was the father in It. Yeah. 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 And he's in uh, Umbrella Academy. He's been in, uh, let's see, a ton of other stuff. Uh, yeah, he's been in a ton of stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, a ton of TV, a ton of daytime stuff. Relic Hunter, Highlander. Yeah, I mean, this guy is, yeah, I mean, he's he's been working a long time. Let's see here. And then... Um, uh, oh, um, one of the moments with him that I thought was incredible, but it was between him and Craig, and that is when uh, Harold gets Craig's name wrong, and he calls him Chris. And the guy's like, oh, no, 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 actually, but my name's Craig. And he goes, it's okay. You can call me Harold. And he turns and walks away, and he goes, okay, Harold. And it's just so amazing being like, it's just like a, such a perfect moment of, you know the the person not apologizing not and, apologizing and the CEO character kind of still being in control because he has so much power over this guy even though he totally told him like oh you have the chance to be the regional manager and yes I don't even know your name but don't worry buddy you've got a shot like oh well, you know he doesn't he kiss. doesn't have oh a shot. absolutely not like like there's there's no way that it's going to him the the portrayal of corporate fascism in slacks I think is the thing that it probably gets the most right. I've worked for companies like this. I've worked for bosses like this. I've worked in environments like this. And while I've never worked in an environment where pants were trying to murder me, I I found a lot of what was going on yeah. in this to be very relatable. Most most folks, uh, most everyday folks, I think in some way, whether it be working in um, the food industry or working in retail, like we've all... Done both? Yeah, yeah. Whether you've worked in food service or in retail, you, you are very familiar with the corporate oversight that comes with just constantly feeling like somebody's looking over your shoulder. Um, or, or, or feeling like if you don't do the right numbers that day, you're going to lose your source of income. Mm -hmm. And, like, for God's sakes, I've worked for both Blockbuster and GameStop. Yikes. I know. Um, Game stocks. Ga oh, God damn it. I love that I, I had, actually, before all this stuff went down, I had two, uh, two sweet little GameStop stocks <laughs> that I bought way back in high school when I was in um, my economics class. And my dad, you know, decided, like, well, let's do it for real. Well, like, like what stocks do you want to buy? GameStop. Like, buy what you know. Okay, sure, fine. And I just forgot about them. And then this whole thing happened with GameStop. And I tried to go and sell them. And they were, like, we're talking, like... A solid nine hundred dollars. Wow. Um, wasn't allowed to sell them. Good so, times. Hooray for capitalism. So you, you know, fair trade, baby. Um, so yeah, it, it's that sense of just corporate oversight, having control over your hours, over your pay, cutting your pay, making it seem like you're getting paid a certain amount, but also, like, requiring you to wear the merch, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great scene where they have her come in, like, like okay, go go and buy your clothes for for tonight when you help us switch everything over. And then not the clothes that you bought a month ago, because that's out of season now. You have to buy the which, clothes that are out of season for this week. Yeah, another huge statement on fast fashion. Yeah. And <laughs> also, you have to be here for this training, but also you don't technically start till 12.01, so you don't get your employee discount until was... then, so... You're just gonna have to pay for the full price for the clothes tonight. It was such a fucked up thing. I mean, that's I mean, that's one of those like, oh, I'll just go then. That's fine. Have a good time, guys. Yeah, but but this was a character who I thought that she was working for an upstanding company that was doing good things. Yeah, like she 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 drank the Kool Aid. Well, she's the opposite of Summer in that Rick and Morty episode with the haunted objects, a shop where where Rick is like, you're literally working for the devil, and she's like, I'm a teenager. Where am I going to get a job that isn't working for some sort of satanic corporation? And it's like, yeah, that's 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 actually the rub. Mm -hmm. like, that, that, he's that, like, at least he's upfront about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ex at least he just says he's the devil. <laughs> but it, but you, I, I, I ended up feeling so bad for her just because, like, this is the one good person, with the exception of. Um, uh, Sa Sahara uh, Bahani. Who, well, yeah, Shruti, yeah. and then also the um, uh, the poor girl who dies, who ends up uh, creating this, uh, who would be uh, Sveta uh, Kumarasan, or is that no, uh, no, no? I don't know. Oh, uh, K 
Kirat. Kirat? Yeah. I, Kirat. Think, I think it's who played Kirat. Yeah, uh, Paritha uh, uh, Muzadar. Um, but yeah, like very most of the characters on screen are pretty awful people. Or not necessarily awful people. They're just... They, they have no illusions about where they are and who they're working for. Yeah, Whereas... Paritha uh, Muzadar, yes, as yeah. Kirat. Yes, just, just confirming that is... That that is the woman who becomes the haunted pants. Mm-hmm. It's it is. It, uh, I I would say the one addendum I would say to this movie that kind of bummed me out is I thought her. I thought I thought um, I thought the way that the movie ended was kind of a bummer when it would have been pretty easy not to spoil anything. Well, like, this this go, this is the prequel to Jimmy Neutron, where well, all the pants go out and. Sh- I, and, and take over the world. You are younger than me. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. I have no idea. I, I, There's literally a Jimmy Neutron movie, I, apparently. I, I believe you, but I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, um, but yeah, like I feel like Libby could have had Libby could have had a, a happier ending, and I think personally that might have played better. I don't know. Uh, I, I wasn't at the test, sc- test screenings, and. Um, so I'm not going to argue with that, but that that to me I thought was just like a for a movie that's a lot of tee hee hee fun for it to have a slightly sour dour ending I thought was a little uh, interesting. But we will see how the film uh, plays on repeat viewings because I think it is a I think it is a fun movie. It is a, it is a good put it on on Friday night now that the pandemic is starting to wane down. Wane. Yeah, we yeah. will. Yeah. We will, and we'll say starting Very to wane. Very carefully down. wane. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Make sure you hang out with people who've had their vaccines. Maybe still be careful. Maybe still wear masks. Maybe still hang out outside. Maybe invest in one of those. Uh, Don't be an idiot. Well, yeah. In, in, in invest in one of those inflatable movie theater screens that can fit in your backyard and That's get a, a projector. Thing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That way you can. Yeah. You don't have to do have a stand-up thing. Oh shit. Yeah. It's like a like a it's just like a mattress. You know, like an air mattress, except it's a movie screen. And oh. you can blow it up, and then when you're not using it, you deflate it, and you put it away. What's wrong with, like, a little C-stand? that uh, Two C-stands, and you put a... Well, the, the C-stands take up a lot of room where, like, uh, an inflatable... Like, just like an inflatable... Like, for the same reason that you don't have an extra mattress in your closet, in case someone happens to visit, you have an inflatable mattress because it takes up a lot less room. Same thing with a movie screen. Yes, if you have the room, it would be great to just have it up all the time. But if you don't, this one deflates, and you can put it in your closet. All right. Yeah, neat. Yeah. I learned something today. Yeah, indeed. Uh, all right, David. Well, let's uh, let's see here. Um, do you have anything else to say about Slacks? Um, again, another huge thank you to to Elza and to uh, to Cynthia, her her rep, for helping set this up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I, I was I was pleasantly surprised by this. You, you I mean, you you don't expect a whole lot with Killer Pants, and you go in with low expectations, yeah. and you come out with those expectations raised. Well, the last Killer Thing movie I had seen was Rubber, which I sort of also watched in preparation for this, just to get a little bit more, like, to have some other... A refresher. Yeah, a refresher to have some other Killer Thing movie to, to compare this to. Rubber, and actually uh, um, one of the onlookers... Um, who was spectating the actual tire mm-hmm. uh, was somebody I've worked with before. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and she's also in, um, oh gosh, what was it? Uh, Better Call Saul. Uh, oh. she's, she's the college student. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah. Um, a super, super wonderful person. But yeah, um, I ended up watching Rubber and forgot that she was in it. And one of the things, though, that is very unfortunate about that movie is that there's really no reason for the movie to exist and they brag about how this movie exists for no reason. And it's just such a... For for a movie to exist with no message, even if it's the bare minimum of messages, seems like such a waste of resources to me. With I, the exception of people making money to if, pay their bills. If, there's, if you're upfront about it, then the nihilism is the point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there are movies that have no message because they aren't trying. And then there's Rubber, which is purposely saying there is no message, which is the, like, I would argue that, like, human centipede kind of falls under the same thing. Like, the point is there is no point. It is just, it is just hideousness and terribleness. Like, even more so than, like, something like Hostel or Saw. What human centipede is doing is just 
heinousness for the purpose of heinousness. And that's not to say that it doesn't have value or a point. But the point is the absence of the point. It's very kind of upfront about that. Yeah. It's making sure to let you know where there are other movies that are just pure fluff. And they don't say anything. But they're not not saying anything on purpose. They're just not trying to be offensive. And that's very different than like human centipede, well, it's, it's like which a, is being offensive on yeah, purpose. Yeah, well, it's like a Disney movie trying to, uh, to tease um, a relationship between a same-sex pair of people just to check off the box, but never actually going all the way yeah, with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, what's that called? That's uh, queer baiting? Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Queer, yeah, same idea of like queer baiting. Like, you, you're almost having a message, mm-hmm. but you're, 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 you're actually you're, just you're, pandering. Yeah, you're pandering and you're too... You're teasing. You're too afraid of, of the backlash to actually go through with it. But you're going to hint, you're going to wink. Which I don't understand because you're still going to get backlash because well, people are now going to... And, like, and, and like that's what they did in the 30s. I mean, that's how you responded to the Hayes Code. I mean, Alfred Hitchcock in North by Northwest, very famously, when he has uh, Cary Grant um, and uh, the lady, you know, uh, uh, go, or um, was it Eve Moraine Saint, go into the, uh, you know, into the train car and spend the night together, and then he cuts directly to a train going into a tunnel. It's pretty clear what he's insinuating is happening. It's like yeah. in that Storenko comic where we see the two of them walk into a bedroom and then the next shot is him putting his gun into a holster. Yeah. We get it, man. But you don't have to show it to show it. And so and like that's and that and it's so crazy to me that like that was going on in the thirties, that was going on in the sixties and it's still going on yeah. today. Yeah. The some some of the low key things that people were doing to get over the hurdle that was the super conservative. Well, I mean, just the famous line from Lauren Bacall, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know how to whistle, don't you? Just put your lips together and blow. You know? Tee-hee. You know Tee-hee. what'll make you whistle? Blowing? Tee-hee-hee, ha-ha-ha. Like, yeah, no, tee have and have not rules. Yeah, also, wait, if you... If wait, you, you mean that wasn't an instructional on how to properly oh, no, whistle? No, oh, no, that, is, that was a, a pure... Uh, oh, man. Oh, yeah, no, that's pure innuendo. Oh, boy. I don't know if you've ever seen to have and have not, but Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart uh, just about set the celluloid on fire with the, like, the, oh, you... Oh, you! Like, <laughs> man, it is—it is like like if you like if, when you watch Mr. and Mrs. Smith, it's so clear that like Brad and Angelina are into each other, and this is kind of the same thing, except it's the '40s, so they're not allowed to say anything. So it's also kind of low key, but also high key at the same time. It's rad, super rad. I highly suggest to have and have not—not not on Shutter, but super rad. <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, let's see here. All right, David. Um, I suppose that means it's time for us to travel in time. And check out some trailers for David. Hang on. Um, oh, what? What's uh, what's wrong? Beep beep pew. Okay. David, the time machine seems to be out of gas. You didn't fill it up at the pump. I mean, we used it earlier today. It's got a finite amount of energy. It's magic, but it's not like magic. You know, it's just magic to us. Ken, because just because gas is so expensive, it doesn't mean that fusion coil is unavailable. It doesn't run on gas. It's from the future. It's complicated. David, all Well, right. what are we going to do? Well, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to... You just want to watch... Do you have any... Is there any movies coming up on Shudder that are good that we don't have to, like... We can just roll the dice on? Hold on. You know what? Actually, I did hear about a certain movie. Did uh, you? Yeah. It, it's on Shudder. Uh, it premiered uh, a few months back. I want to say it was, it was around 2020. Um... But it's called Anything for Jackson. Okay. And it just so happens uh, that Cynthia was, was happens to uh, to rep somebody else. What? Uh, a certain actor named Julian Richings. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Ken, Ken do, you, do you know who Julian Richings is? I have heard the name before. I believe he is a prolific Canadian actor who's been in, like, almost everything. Uh, he has over 213 credits. To, that is to be that is that is to be is, exact. That is a whole lot of credits. Let me let me let me scroll down this list and and just name off a couple of them. Uh, for one thing, like you might recognize him from uh, from Man of Steel at the very beginning. He's one of the Kryptonians. Yeah, yeah, credits. he's one of the Kryptonian judges. 
Um, or yeah, what one of the what you call them? Oh gosh. Um, well, I guess I, I guess I guess judges or judges, one of the leaders, senators, uh, representatives. He, yeah, uh, he, he's credited under as Lorem. All right, good. Um, but he was also uh, let's see, puts him here as weird janitor and urban legend. Um, you could also recognize him from Wrong Turn. Uh, he he has. I mean, he was in X Men Last Stand as the mutant theater organizer. So I mean, that's. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was on the TV show Patriot, which I've heard really no, good he, things about. He's he's one of those character actors that just. He pops up everywhere, he and he like, has and he has such a uh, recognizable he has such recognizable features and such a character. Yeah, look. He, he like he uh, looking at a lot of his uh, his credits, it, it appears very much that like he's one of those characters who comes onto a TV show and then ends up coming back a bunch of a uh, bunch more. Like he's on Orphan Black, he's not in every episode, but he's in a bunch of stuff from 2014 and 2016. Uh, in Supernatural, he's on the show from 2010 to 2015. In uh, yeah, like it, it, he is one of those characters who, once you cast him, you tend to find reasons to bring him back more and more because he's just good. Yeah. Oh, he's in the Transporter TV series as well. He is indeed. Oh, very cool, very cool. Well, yeah. um, I guess then, yeah, no, I guess uh, anything for Jackson, it is. That's that's what we'll do. Yeah. So yeah, everybody, um, yeah, get excited. So we'll be doing an interview with with Julian Richings. And that will accompany our our chat about the the film that he has on Shutter. Anything for Jackson? Very cool, David. Do you have any plugs that you want to plug? You know, uh, just the usual. Uh, I run our Instagram page at Shutter underscore Show. So check out any updates that we have uh, going on over there. Feel free to message us on there or on our Gmail. Uh, what is our Gmail again, Ken? ShutterShow at Gmail dot com. Yeah, and if you want to check out my my boring everyday life, you can check me out at underscore DW Marlowe on Instagram. Ken, what about yourself? Do you have any pluggables? Uh, I do. You can check me out on Instagram and on Twitter at Ken Stachnik S T A C H N I K. You can check out my dog and our mascot Freddy Potatoes that's Freddy with an IE on both Instagram and on uh, Twitter yeah. you can check out uh, Shutter Show on Twitter at Shutter Show you can check uh, our Gmail out Shuttershow at gmail.com and other than that yeah we, we asked Elza if she had any pluggables she doesn't really do social media uh, other than just people she's close with on Facebook. So, yeah, so check, um, out, but, yeah, uh, check uh, out Slacks on Shudder. Yeah, and um, which also uh, she won a couple of awards for uh, over at the Fantasia Festival. Mm -hmm. um, been well received. Yeah, been very been very well received. And feel free also maybe to do a little bit of research in some of the climate stuff that she's, uh, that she's up to. Uh, she's a big proponent for um, fighting climate change. Yeah, big activist. And we talk a little bit about that in, in the interview as well. Well, yeah, they heard that already. Oh, yeah, of course they did. Yeah, they it happened already. Oh, that's right. That's in time, the past. Time machine. That's I know why. the time machine's broken, David. Uh, that's understandable. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, good night, good luck. We love you. And kind of the fuck yourselves.